Knowing how to use alternative fuel is very important, especially during an emergency. And especially being women, we really need to know how to use these different types of fuels. My husband Aaron will do a series of videos on alternative fuels for cooking and for heating. Okay, this is the introductory video to our alternative fuel series. In this video, we're going to talk about a lot of the different types of alternative fuels that you can use during an emergency. We want you to be able to prepare and have a variety of different options. I've had several people ask how to store fuel to have a week, a month, or even a year's supply of fuel for heating and cooking. First, I want to assure you that it is possible. Certainly, those who live in apartments or within the cities will be more restricted, but there are several options that you can choose for your particular situation, at least so far as you can have emergency fuel for several weeks. In order to do this, you need to evaluate your personal situation and then choose the best fuel alternative for your situation. To get started in this series, we will introduce you to various types of fuel. Propane, kerosene, alcohol, white fuel, charcoal, and wood. Now keep in mind that I cannot show you everything about these fuels, but you should be able to get started well enough uh, to have choices to build an alternative fuel supply. When you're purchasing stoves, or lights, or lanterns, or other heaters, it is important for you to include a variety whenever possible. Now what that means is if you purchase a stove or a lantern, it is better if you can use the same stove or the same lantern for cooking or heating as well. Also, it is better if that same stove or lantern can utilize more than one type of fuel. So as much as possible, consider multi-purpose and multi-fuel. For example, this volcano stove that we have right here can actually use propane, charcoal, or wood. A uh, stove back here will use propane, or we can actually modify it so that we can use charcoal. This lantern is an amazing lantern, we'll talk about it in a special video all by itself, uh, because it can use any liquid fuel, such as alcohol, gasoline, diesel, kerosene, white Coleman fuel, or just about any mixture of the above. More importantly, it can be used as a lantern, but it can also be used and put an adapter on top for heat. And we'll show you that in this other video. And with the adapter, it can be converted into a stove. The stove that you can see in the back, which is a heater, can only use kerosene, but with a little bit of adaptation, you can actually make it into a stove top for a pressure cooker or, or, or another pan. Before we talk about any other type of the alternative fuel, I need to clearly caution you about safety. Combustion, which is another word for burning fuel, will generally give off either carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide. Now both require care, but carbon monoxide is especially dangerous. And when we breathe, we give off carbon dioxide. So in and of itself, carbon dioxide is not that, that dangerous, but it does re uh, consume oxygen and therefore it does require ventilation. Without proper ventilation, the combustion process will eventually replace your usable oxygen in the air with carbon dioxide and therefore cause asphyxiation. So you do need to be careful with that. However, more critical is carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is colorless, it's odorless, and it is a deadly gas. Because you can't see it, taste it or smell it. Carbon monoxide can kill you before you even know it's there. The great danger of carbon monoxide is its attraction to the hemoglobin that's in your bloodstream. Now, when it's breathed in, the carbon monoxide will actually replace the oxygen within your cells, and when carbon monoxide is present in the air, it rapidly accumulates in the blood and causing symptoms similar to the flu, such as headaches, fatigue, nausea, dizzy spells, confusion, irritability, even, level, even as levels increase, vomiting, and loss of consciousness, and eventually the brain damage or death can result. I want you to know I have personally witnessed the deadly effects of carbon monoxide. It is dangerous, and so when we talk about carbon monoxide, pay close attention. 
So, all combustion requires ventilation. So, we will need to open a window to allow fresh air, but some combustion produces carbon monoxide and must be kept outdoors. This is why we're doing the video out here. Before we go to the other videos, I want to help you understand another concept, and that is BTUs. Now, one BTU is the amount of energy needed to heat one pound of water one degree. Boy, that was helpful, wasn't it? Well, I'm going to try to simplify this a little bit more. If you take and place 16 ounces, that's about one pint or two cups of water at 59 degrees Fahrenheit into a stovetop pan and turned on the gas burner, it would take one BTU to raise the temperature of the water to 60 degrees. If I want to raise the temperature from 60 degrees to 212 degrees, well, that's a difference of 132 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, that means it will take 132 BTUs to heat one pint of water to boiling temperature, starting at 60 degrees. The problem is that no stove is 100% efficient. As a matter of fact, much of that heat, maybe 50% or more, is escaping. So the trick is to get a stove that is the most efficient to capture the most available heat. Well, generally a stove may be rated as something like 9,000 BTUs. Usually that means 9,000 BTUs per hour. Or that's about 150 BTUs per minute. So theoretically, a pint of water should boil in just one minute, right? Well, remember, there's a lot of heat escaping. So it might actually take two or three or four minutes, depending on how, many, uh, how, how much is escaping. So let's, if it took two minutes, we'd say that that stove is 50% efficient or so. However, that, doesn't, that does give us a little background to compare stoves, BTU to BTU. Now what about heating a room? Well, the one pound of water measurement isn't going to help it or make it very easy to calculate. So, in general, if you can estimate the size of the heater you need by multiplying the square footage of the room you plan to heat to, from up to 70 degrees by a factor of 22. Now, for example, if you had a 20 foot by 20 foot basement den or another room that you wanted to heat, you would perform the following calculations. 20 feet by 20 feet is 400, so that's a total number of square feet to be heated. Then, that 400 square feet, multiply that by 22, and that gives you 8,800 BTUs per hour. So, if you're going to buy a stove and a heater is giving off 10,000 BTUs per hour, you know that it could probably heat a room about 20 feet by 20 feet. Now, a heater, such as the one in the back, will actually heat 23,000 BTUs. Or it will actually heat a room approximately 1,200 square feet. One last comparison. How do kilowatts compare to BTUs for heat? Now, it's a little bit more messy with the math, so I'll just give you some round numbers. You see a lot of 1,500 watt electric heaters on the market. The math is one kilowatt is about 3,513 BTUs. To make it easy, just know that a 1500 watt heater, like, like the ones that you can find in most department stores, are equivalent to about 5119, we'll just say 5000 BTUs. So you can compare, so if you had a, a heater such as this one back here that will give off about 10,000 BTUs, that's essentially equal to two of those 1500 watt electric heaters that you would buy. Please take to watch the rest of the series on the alternative fuels at simplylivingsmart.com.